this is, this is, this is. Hey, hey, what's up, you guys? Brand new episode of the podcast. It has been snowing here. It is December 5th. Uh, last week, off and on, we got snow. It stopped. Roads cleared up. It's been it's been off and on. It's been crazy. But um, I'm not really worried about it. Like I think I've mentioned this before. I uh, Years ago, got caught in this insane blizzard on tour with Anne Berlin. I was doing a solo tour with them. And... I was riding, uh, Jake Langley, a buddy of mine, was driving me on the tour, and he had this Honda Element. It was actually his girlfriend's Honda Element, and that thing made it all over the place. We were in just waist-high snow, and we're just... I don't recommend driving through waist-high snow in an Element or in, in anything, really, but we made it where we needed to go, and even though the shows got canceled, we made it there. Like, we got there. And there was a few times we almost ran out of gas. A few times we almost just were stuck in the snow, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. A lot of harrowing or harrowing, I'm not sure how you say that. A lot of harrowing situations, you know. It was really, really touch and go for a while. But because of that experience, I, you know, the next year when I was, you know, up for it, I need a new car or whatever. I didn't get a new car. I got a used Honda Element, and it has served me so well. I've been, you know, cruising all over the place in the snow. Last year, I did this, you know, I put chains on it, and our snow was like, it was a couple feet for over a week straight, like two weeks straight of of a couple feet of snow everywhere. It was pretty insane. So my car, it it rocked it. Like, I really, really am proud (laughs) I'm proud of this car. It's not the coolest looking car, but it really, really works really well. And it fits tons of mail. It can fit vinyl orders. It can fit a bunch of holiday orders, whatever it is. It's it's really great at fitting merch supplies. So, by the way, thank you. We released our MXPX holiday line. Um, and, yeah, it had a bunch of orders. And... I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Keeping us busy this year for sure. So a lot of you are asking about when's the thing? When's the thing? Just hang tight. Hang tight. I don't know. I think soon. So and and if you don't know what that means, then don't worry about it. Just just do your thing. (laughs) But uh, let's get to some voicemails. Okay, let's find let's find out what we're what's happening here. Here we go. Hey, Mike, this is Clinton from Corpus Christi. Uh, kind of just wanted to get your take on working with John Davis from Super Drag. Um, when I heard you two were going to be on a song together, man, it kind of pretty much blew my mind. Y'all two are my favorite artists. Um, if you can kind of explain what the whole process was about, you know, writing that song, choosing John Davis to be on it, and uh, just... Uh, what the guy's like. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Thanks. Cool. Oh, there's more. Anything else? I have a feeling he didn't hang up. No, he didn't hang up. Cool. No worries, man. Corpus Christi, what's up, Texas? Um, shout out. Love you guys down there. So, John Davis is a hero man he is such a good songwriter he's such a good dude i haven't talked to him in a little while um that's gonna prompt me i should i should send him a text say what up um so going back i don't know i i I got a hold of him through a mutual friend somebody that i knew knew him and hooked us up but he knew of mxpx of course by the time you know i had talked to him but uh he sang on sad sad song from mxpx that's on her secret weapon album and I, at the time, I didn't know I wanted him to sing on it, but I really wanted some. That song was just like a kind of a doo pop song, do 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 do, like a '50s style pop song. And and I knew I just wanted like another voice on there. And and John, you know, just has such a unique voice. So if you listen to him on that track, it sounds nothing like anything we really normally do. So that was huge. Another track he sang on. For Tumble Down, he he sang on a Tumble Down song, and I think he sang on "I'm Still Here," which is 
on our on the self titled Tumble Down album, second track on the on the album. I'm not sure exactly, something like that. Um, oohs and ahs, really, really just elevated the part. You know, it's a bridge part. He sang on. Um, I could be getting some details wrong, but I'm pretty sure he sang on "I'm Still Here" and both of those songs. Uh, you know, songs "I'm Still Here," sad, sad song, were were songs that you know I thought were like pretty good, but just wanted just wanted a little extra sauce on it. You know, and and sad, sad song especially was why we had John sing on that, and you know, just the fact that he when he came and did. I'm still here, and he did all these vocals, these extra vocals that I didn't know he was going to do. I was blown away when I heard it, and I couldn't be happier still with the performance. He's he's amazing. So John John Davis is absolutely one of the best songwriters. Like I, I became a huge fan of his when we were we were like gonna do um, the Ever Passing Moment album with Jerry Finn, and he was he had just produced that album, Super Drag, Head Trip in Every Key. And that album, like we were listening to that for the production reasons, you know, just like this is what Jerry does or has done. And we just fell in love with the songs and the album. The album is just amazing. It's so it's so well crafted. It's it's what I would say uh we definitely were striving for when we were making records, you know, just like make a really well crafted record that doesn't have a bunch of mistakes and things like that. We're still working on it, but, um, you know, super drags back, by the way, they're, they're playing shows again. They've got merch, they're doing their thing. So if you guys are ever were a fan of super drag or, or for that matter, don't know about them. They're a great, a great power pop band, like really, really amazing. Um, alternative rock, whatever you want to call it. Love their music. Um, Valley of the Dying Stars, Head Trip in Every Key. Uh, those are the two albums that I mainly would throw on, but all of their albums are amazing. So uh, let's move on. Thanks for the call. Let's get to the next. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Jeff from Des Moines and my bro Kenny from Omaha just coming back from a stellar weekend uh, in Milwaukee and Chicago. Amazing show, so much fun. I uh, just wanted to say thanks for doing those meet and greets afterwards. It's a lot of cool, to con- uh, a lot of fun, and real cool to connect with you guys. Um, I don't know how you guys seem interested in everything we have to say as your fans, but it's really cool how engaged you guys are, and just absolutely love it. So uh, Chicago was an absolute blast. Really comfortable, great show. Um, I, I may have been overserved. I was going. I tried to ask you a little bit about Tumble Down, and hoping maybe you can expand on a little bit more, uh, as I feel like I just missed those years. I missed something awesome. So, question was, kind of tell me about the genesis of Tumble Down and a couple of your favorite memories. And then I think I asked you that night. Any chance? Uh, you know, I probably missed my chance to see Tumble Down play live, but. Uh, would you and Jack ever consider doing like an online show? You know, all the gigs you guys used to do uh, during quarantine with MXPX. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I'd gladly uh, pay some money to, to see some old Tumble Down uh, shows, uh, songs played. So, again, absolutely had a blast. Milwaukee was great as well. A uh, little hotter, a little dirtier. A uh, lot of fun. Love both the shows. Can't wait to see you guys again soon. And looking forward to the new album next year. All right. Thanks, Mike. Jeff, I love the energy. Thanks for the call. You know, uh, it's just so so crazy you're bringing up Tumble Down because, you know, I often think about it, and I'll tell you about it. Um, so Tumble Down is a band that I started, well, 2007 is the official, the official year that we started. We played our first show in 2007. So I would say <clears throat> around, the real genesis is around 1999, I started writing and demoing out some, like, I would say country style songs like hillbilly songs um slow guitar parts you know hickey vocals that kind of thing um but just for fun you know i was listening to a lot of hank williams at the time back in 99 so and 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 back then you know we had been doing mxpx for so long so long i mean since 1992 so less than 10 years but uh you know i just wanted to do something different you know like just branch out the the songwriting skills and things like that and and just 
I was just interested in it. So that was the the genesis. I did some demos that um, wasn't called Tumble Down. It wasn't really called anything, I don't think, back then. Um, but I read, I was reading a book, I was reading a book uh, called A Life. And it's a Woody Guthrie biography. And it was just talking about his life and, and what he did and all this. And there was just a, a line in it, a throwaway line that said, you know, he was walking through town amidst all these tumble down buildings. And I was like, man, that just like really rang out to me, tumble down buildings, a way to describe something. And I was like, well, that's kind of ragtaggy, you know, and, and kind of a cool way to describe the type of music I'm trying to put together with this kind of a mix between country and punk and pop, you know, like it, it's very catchy yet yet has all these country riffs and country sentiments, even some like country style lyrics, but the songwriting, the chord progressions and the the vocal style is all punk. So not even, not even punk, I'd say like more, more power pop punk stuff like that, you know? So I put together a band and uh, local here in town in Bremerton and we were just jamming a lot, you know, and we finally put together our little run of, of, uh, shows down the coast. And our first show was in Portland, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and at the Hawthorne front bar, not the, not, it, it was at Hawthorne theater, but in the bar, you know, in the front area. So it was a small show, but it was, that was our first show. We didn't have, I don't think we had a drummer yet. Um, I want to say it was, well, no, no, we had a drummer. Har Harley was there, but we just didn't have a full drum set. So it was like everything was acoustic. That's what it was. So it wasn't that we didn't have a drummer. We had a drummer, but it was it was like a stripped-down drum set. And then we had uh, two acoustic guitars. So Jack didn't play electric yet. So eventually we moved into more of even more punk, less country. But uh, that was our first tour in uh, 2007. So... I'll, I'll try to give you a little, a, you know, short version of, of all the adventures we had. But we, we did tours all the way to Chicago and Texas, you know, Houston. We made it all over Houston and uh, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, all of the Texas. You know, we played there, we played Oklahoma. So, like, everywhere from Chicago west we played. We didn't quite get east of Chicago. We were planning on doing some tours over there, but we just didn't quite ever make it. So we toured, we got signed to a label in, uh, in Austin, Texas, we put out two albums. Uh, but our first, our very first release was self-released. It was our Atlantic city EP. And, you know, it's just stories, you know, Oliver Peck was on tour with MXPX and we were in Atlantic city. We were gambling, uh, playing craps, playing dice. And we just started betting on Heart eights, heart eight, heart eight, heart eight, and just hitting them, you know. And and I was betting nickels and dimes, and I walked out of there with like five hundred bucks. So I was, I, I, you know, I think Oliver had like over a thousand after we left, you know. And, and if we were betting real bets, we would have been thousand errors for sure. Anyway, things like that, just like that's how I wrote that Atlantic City song, and 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 um, you know just went on from there, you know, because MXPX was in a downtime where Tom and Yuri were really busy. Um, the music business was terrible. Like we weren't making any money. We were, we'd go out to do shows and tours and come back with nothing. And, you know, it was just a really rough time. So we were just laying low for a while. And I was like, for me, I just need to create something. I need to make something. And, and that's where tumble down came from. And, um, we did that till 2013 and, and then went on hiatus, uh, put out a couple albums, a couple seven inches, things like that. And really proud of what we did. Our shows were so much fun. Sorry you missed it because, uh, seeing tumble down live, there's nothing like it. It's, it's so much energy. It's party. It's like, we drank a lot during those shows, but, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'd be ready to do it again. You know, I, I think, you know, it'll be a while because MXPX is now pretty busy 
and keeps us really busy. Um, but like you said, you know, we have new MX Peaks coming coming next year, and and um, someday, sure, I'm gonna say someday. I'm not opposed to doing tumble down. I would love to. So you know, get get back together with Jack, do something. But um, we'll just see. You know, we'll play it by ear. And and I've I've said this publicly. I think you know. I'll say it again. I have a, a few ideas. I have a few tumble down songs, and then a, f- a bunch of like a handful of song ideas that I would need to flesh out in order to like actually have a new album. But technically we're not too far off. I mean, it would just take, it would take some, some concentration on that end, but um, I would love to do some, some tumble down stuff someday. But uh, right now MXPX is, is driving the train for sure. All right, let's get to the next caller. Hey, Mike, it's Seth from New Jersey again. Um, just listened to Social D and heard Sick Boy, and I know you guys did the cover. And I remember hearing back that you guys had to change the lyrics from he'll make love to her all night to he'll hang out with her all night. So I was just wondering, is this the only song you had to change the lyrics to? So you can be, I guess it was at the time you guys were in Christian bookstores, or is, is there any version of the song but you recorded that actually says he'll make love there all night, or do you play it live like that? Just wondering. Just listen to Social D and just wanted to know. So, uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Love you, bro. Bye. Thanks, man. That's deep. That's a deep one. That's far back. Um, yeah, that's kind of cheesy. I know. Back then, things were so different. You know, we were kids. We Everybody was kids, and we didn't really understand the world. And, you know, Tooth and Nail now and again would ask us to do something here and there. Like, I, I think... For one, they asked us to do an Alter Boys cover. And they asked us to do, uh, what was that, uh, Petra, Petra cover. So, like, when we did covers from, like, those bands, we were just asked to do them. <laughs> you know, we didn't know. They weren't, like, our favorite band. Like, nowadays, when we do when we do a song, it's usually, like, a song we really like. Or a song that at least one of us really likes. Like, hey, let's do this, please. Um, but back then, things were a little different. Yeah, they, we, we, we were easy going for the most part, and we changed it. But no, there is not a different version of of the, the lyrics because, I mean, Brandon was in the studio with us quite a bit for that recording. That was on the cover, and that was early on in our career. We were kids. He, he would come by and, and just kind of like, not that he, he wasn't like telling us what to do all the time at all. Like, that wasn't what, but he probably like, I don't really remember, but he probably suggested it or something. I don't, I don't know. That's a... It's a deep one, <laughs> but it is kind of funny. We can, we can laugh about it now. Uh, but to be clear, yeah, live, I would just sing it. I would just sing it regular, like the, the real lyrics live. So, um, yeah. And, and another thing along those lines, when we recorded at the show, live at the show, we did our cover of, the KKK took my baby away. And that was another thing like on the tooth and nail version of that album, that song was not on there, but on the, the regular A and M version, it was on there. So very confusing to people, but it was just straight up. I, I don't know. It was like, do you not want to call maybe because it was a political song and it was technically calling out publicans or something, but, um, I always thought that they they were like, oh, it's too spicy to have just the just the letters KKK in a song in a title on our bookshelf, on our record shelf, whatever. Right? I always figured it was that something like that. Interesting though. Interesting. All right. Thanks for your call, Seth. Hey, Mike. This is Bob from Rochester, New York. It's been a long time fan of you guys for. And since the, the days of the old tooth and nail mail order catalog, pretty sure I still have my Poconacha cassette laying around somewhere. Um, love your music throughout the years. I got to say uh, the most, maybe it's not that recent anymore, but one of my most favorite ones that you've done um, actually wasn't with MSPX, even though I love, love you guys. Um, it was Ballad of a Factory Man from Tumble Down. That song was just, uh, just, absolutely fantastically done wondering um what went into that in in the uh the process did you like do you have friends or people that are are 
close to you that work in a factory because it just felt like a song that you could really feel. And then the um, the next thing I had was kind of a funny story and a question. Um, so MXPS stands as like the band that got away. It's, 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 it's like the girl that got away, but it's the band that got away. Um, do you have a band that you've always wanted to see and just never could? Um, so I got to tell you, way back, I think it was 95 or 96, you guys were playing at a festival in Darien Lake um, called Kingdom Bound. I think you were only there one day. It's a huge, like, I don't know. I haven't been there in so long. It's like a week long or a three day long festival. And it was right when, uh, um, what happened? Right when what? Okay. Let's go to the. Hey, it's Bob from Rochester again. Just going to continue it okay. here. Right. So, um, made the list. We were going to see you and then, uh, our car broke down. So we couldn't <sighs> see you. And then you guys were playing in LaSalle Park in Buffalo, 99 or 98 at Warp Tour. And it was super hot. Um, I don't know if you remember anything about the show. Like there were fire trucks there spraying the crowd down. Uh, it was really weird lineup. Like Eminem was playing, uh, Blink was playing, Green Day. I mean, it was, it was, it was some pretty interesting stuff. So we got, uh, no effects was playing. We got about three songs into you. And my girlfriend at the time, um, somebody was crowd surfing and they clocked her right in the head. Totally accident, not on purpose, but, uh, she actually got like knocked out. So we never got to see a full MXPX set. I do watch, um, some live stuff on YouTube and would love if you guys came to Rochester or Buffalo again sometime. But is there a band that, that you have always wanted to see and then it just, everything didn't work out anyway thanks man all right bob thanks man i'm glad we got through that um let me go back tumble down thank you crazy it we didn't plan to have two tumble down uh calls but i'm glad we do um ballad of a factor man um yeah i wrote that song early on tumble down days um it's on the, the atlantic city ep i think it is um the digital version or whatever and that was something, you know, I, I uh, we, we recorded it. K.W. Miller um, from the Rocky Point All-Stars, he played guitar on that. Played, played, he played some of the riffies, riffy stuff, like the... Um, and Jack played on that, I think, as well. Um, early on, though, it was a little different than, than say, like our actual album. So I'm just trying to think back. Um, now, I wrote that I wrote that song just, it wasn't from a personal experience because I've never worked in a factory, but uh, I wrote it as if I was, there's a lot of parallels, you know, when you're, when you're tr a traveling person, like, like a musician is a traveling person, you can borrow narratives you know you can borrow a narrative from a you know factory worker or somebody that's working the fields and i've read a lot of books and so i just uh, i've read a lot of books that sounds really dumb <laughs> i read uh on the road by jack kerouac and that honestly was I, I have it's funny the book isn't really about anything there's so many just little things that just happen in the book and then that makes up the story but but I remember little bits and pieces about that book, about like where he goes, where he stays, what he, who he talks to. And those little things kind of just like enter my mind at times. And I think in that way, so do other stories I read and other books I've read and other people I've talked to and things I've seen in movies and TV shows. And, you know, it all just, you know, just melds into ideas. And uh, that's where that song came from is just, I was probably reading, reading stuff, something that, that, I don't know, like sparked an idea working 20 hours in a factory for parts. Um, I, I probably was trying to write a, um, you know, a country song, to be honest. Like I was just trying, you know, trying to do it. Like, um, 
yeah, uh, Johnny Cash style, right? Like that, that, that's kind of what I was going for. So I appreciate that. Now, uh, bands that got away, got to admit, I never saw Johnny Cash. That would be, that would be one. <laughs> you know, I've seen Willie Nelson. He's amazing. Um, I've seen Tom Petty. Petty was great. Um, so it's like bands like that, artists like that, that I probably would, would love to see. Uh, the Ramones, that's a band that I never got to see live that breaks my heart. You know, one of my favorite bands, The Clash. You know, The Clash, I never got to see the actual Clash live. You know, we, we opened for Joe Strummer on uh, a solo tour he did, full band and everything, but but it wasn't The Clash. You know, it wasn't called The Clash. It was Joe Strummer and the Mescaleras, so... Yeah, the uh, the band that got away, the Ramones. But there's so many. There's so many more than just just the Ramones. I mean, um, at one time it was the Descendants. The Descendants because I was a huge fan. I had seen All, uh, which was one of the first couple punk shows I had seen, and then I had never seen the Descendants, and, and none of us had in the band. And then 1997, they came back out and did a tour just happened to be playing the night before our tour started in Dallas, Texas. It was uh, Deep Ellum Live, where, you know, it's the same place we did, we play there now. Now it's just a different name, but uh, we went and saw the Descendants play. Uh, sent, uh, what was it? Um, yeah, I was trying to remember who, who opened. I can't remember right now. I think Suicide, Suicide, uh, Suicide Machines opened, and... Um, Oh, I'm spacing on the other band, but yeah, it was just a stellar show all around and we loved it. So that, that inspired us. And then we did our tour or whatever, but then that summer we met up and did warp tour, our first warp tour and got to hang out with the descendants. And, um, so that would have been, but it all worked out. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go back and just say the Ramones. I saw Elvis Costello. I saw, you know, I've seen dis Social Distortion. I've seen, you know, all, all the punk bands that we know that we love. We've seen, you know, Bad Religion. Um, but, you know, there's so many that we haven't. There's so many. There's so many. All right. If you have a chance, people, go see your favorite bands play before it's too late. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. It's just, it's not easy out there. It's a hard life for everybody. Not, just, you know, these punkers, you know, these punkers are are just trying to claw their way to each show i see it i see it happen all the time i talk to people yeah it's crazy so go see your favorites let's do one more and uh and then we'll call it a call it a day a night whatever it is hope you guys are ready for christmas because it's coming real quick less than three weeks away wow all right here, here's the last one hi mike this is josh from the skate punk band gross g-r-o-s-s Exclamation point. I've got two questions for you. Uh, first off, a couple months ago, you talked about kind of the road that got you to talking to major labels and how you ended up on a major label. And I was wondering if you'd kind of give that same detail to some of the other label experiences you've had, like uh, Side One Dummy, Getting Back on Tooth and Nail, and you spoke some on being on fat. I was kind of curious, did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? A little more details on that, maybe. And also also wondering if the city of Bremerton has ever used move to Bremerton in any kind of way to try to get people to come to Bremerton. Been curious about that, too. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Thanks, Josh. All right, well, start with major labels or indie labels. Um, I think you just wanted me to talk about our, some, some more experiences with it because I think I'm trying to think of when I talked about major labels last. Maybe I was talking about going to New York, uh, meeting with uh, the head of Sony, Don Einer, him, him uh, mentioning, hey, you want us to take care of Brandon Ebel for you? And we're like, ah, no, don't do that, please, you know, whatever. You can thank me, Brandon. Thank me. Thank me by buying me a Porsche or some sort of car. 
<laughs> I don't know. I only say that because it's another inside story that I think I've mentioned where he was like talking to a friend of mine that was also signed to Tooth and Nail Records. I'm talking about Brandon Evil right now. And he, uh, they went out, they were going out to, to dinner or something. And, and uh, Brandon is, hops in his Porsche 911 or whatever it is. And uh, my buddy gets in the, the seat next to him and, and he looks over at my buddy and goes, you know this car? MXPX bought this car. And then took off. It's <laughs> just so funny. I love it. So, uh, you know, everybody's a person, right? Like these people seemingly can't be real, but they're like actually real people, yet they still act like crazy robots. Uh, I'm just talking about like people that you hear about that do weird things. You're like, is that a real person? <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Um, labels, though. I mean, okay, let's go back to the beginning. I mean, when we when we got signed to Tooth and Nail, this was 1994. We didn't have really any interest in getting signed yet. We didn't think about that. We were just we were just going. Let's just make some shows. Let's get some shows going. Like we want to play shows, and we did a show with Poor Old Lou. Handed a demo to a cassette demo thing. It was an. It was actually a full album. It wasn't a demo. It was a full album that was recorded uh, on a boombox. Like you push record on the boombox in the middle of the garage where we practiced. This one particular one was at at Yuri's dad's house in his garage. So anyway, we gave Aaron Sprinkle the cassette, and uh, he kind of dug what we were doing and told Brandon about it and. Not only did we get signed to Tooth and Nail, but he also got us hooked up with the Seattle scene, and we started playing in Seattle at these, at these, you know, the House of Funk, and like where all these other bands uh, would throw parties and shows and stuff. And so we just started playing more and more out because of that. But um, we got, you know, Brandon wanted us to do a seven inch. He's like, let's do a seven inch, you know, two songs, three songs, whatever. Um, and we did that. And when he heard that, he, in, in the song on there was suggestion box. And I want to say, uh, too much thinking those two songs and do, 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 Yeah. Something like that. Um, and he was like, let's just do a full album. Okay. Uh, we're like, yeah, all right. I, I was, I was excited, you know, and, and. I remember Andy, Andy Husted, his parents were a little skeptical. They're like, what's going on here? Should we take a look at the contract? And honestly, they were the only ones that were correct about the situation. They, sh we should have, but it's funny because if we, it's a catch 22, because if we hadn't signed that contract and gotten ripped off, we, I would not be sitting here right now telling you this story. I would be telling a different story about how we almost got signed to a record label one day. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, who knows? Um, you know, when, after A&M, when we, we asked to leave A&M, which oh, there's so many things we could have done differently. We, we should have asked to be paid to leave A&M instead of like, here, just keep the money. We're going to go like so many, so many bad decisions. But again, here we are doing pretty good. Not going to complain. So. We we signed to, to Side One Dummy, and Creighton Burke was still our manager at the time, and he started talking to Joe Sib and and Bill, and uh, those guys own Side One, and it was pretty pretty cool, you know, like because because Joe Sib is um, a, an old friend, I've known him for years. His band, um, his band is, has been touring, you know, forever, and now he's a at the time, he wasn't a stand-up comedian, but now he's a stand-up comedian. It's it's funny, but um, yeah. So so that that experience was very easy. It was very easy. It was it was like let's do this. We'll do this. Blah, blah, blah. You know, very hands-on still. You know, like which I loved. Um, and not much to report about Side One Dummy. Like I really, I really feel like yeah, sure. There's some nitty gritty things I could complain about, but. Overall, they've been nothing but great. I, I really appreciate 
working with a label like Side One Dummy, and and even since we've been off the label, they have been great to work with. Because, you know, the myth is, oh, once you get out of your contract, you don't have to work with those people anymore. But it's not really true because if they, just because you don't have a current contract with them, you might have releases with them. And so you still might have to deal with it. So, you know, I feel like um, keep that in mind. You know, don't don't burn, burn, sure, burn bridges. Do what you want to do. But, but um, you know, I feel like, at the end of the day, we got to work with people um, for, you know, longer than just the album cycle. And uh, I keep that in mind. But Side One was great. Um, let's get to what, what what was after that? Side One Dummy. Resigned to them. The only reason we did was because they gave us our publishing back, which was great. Um, huge deal. And, and working with them was cool, too. I mean, it wasn't really... I, I can't... I, I don't want to complain about it. Like... We wanted to bury the hatchet and um, and just try to build something new, like rebuild something that that fell apart. And we tried, and I feel like we did a, a cool little run on Tooth and Nail again, you know, for our second stint. But ultimately, I think there's too much baggage to truly have complete trust, and and it's really hard to to work with people if you don't trust them, and. and and I, and I don't say this because I'm saying I don't trust you the nail or whatever, you know, like it's, it's deeper than that. And, and I, and I do feel like there's a mutual respect between us two, even, even now, like, uh, we're friendly, we get along, we're fine. But, um, but back then it was like, I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if, if things were much more on the, I trust you, you trust me, let's really, really make this record happen. And I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm reading into it a little bit more than than is necessary to be honest, but uh, there's more there. There's more to all of this. You know, I could keep talking and keep talking, but I got to get to your question about move to Bremerton. Move to Bremerton has been used in a campaign. When we got uh, this was probably around 2005 or somewhere in there. Um, in coincidentally, around the same time we were on on signed to side one dummy but um we got the key to bremerton and the theme song well not the theme song the song moved to bremerton was made the official song for bremerton um for their tourist campaign so they definitely used move to bremerton to try to get people to come to bremerton i don't know how effectively they used it or how long they used it but I never really heard it, you know, played anywhere, but you know, I wasn't out there looking to be, to be told to move to Bremerton, I guess, but <laughs> I don't know, but we, they did use it. Yeah, they did use it. Very cool. Um, they could use it again. It could come back. You never know. You just never know. All right. Um, sorry, I don't have a better answer, but the answer is yes. Um, the keys to the city, however, that's sitting on my shelf in my basement at my house. And you don't really need the actual key to the city as long as you have the picture that you can turn to. So if you go into some random building in Bremerton, you can be like, hey, it's cool. I have the key to the city. And then you show them that picture. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Shout out to Bob McKnight. Please go check out his podcast, The Bob and Katie Show. It's a great podcast. They steer clear of politics. It's just about funny, weird things that happen. Weird, weird things that happen. Butt stuff, weird food stuff, uh, drinks. The things that they drink when they're podcasting, super weird. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll let you guys get to it. Uh, the link is in the show notes if you want to check it out. Um, I mention it because Bob's a good guy, and he does a great job making this podcast happen for me. So I appreciate you, Bob. Um, thank you guys for listening. Please, if you haven't already done so, you could subscribe to the podcast. You could push like a, the heart or like or whatever it is button on whatever you're listening to. Would love to to uh, to get that, to get that like or that follow. And of course, please call in, leave me a voicemail, 360-830-6660. Would love to have you on the podcast. All right. 
mxpeaks.com. Thanks for your orders. Happy holidays. I'll see you next week. Peace.